the giant sultan gynecologist and midway base of surgeon and i'm uh, the lead for the endometriosis director uh, at center at epsom st helia and also clinical director so what i thought would be helpful for us when it comes to looking at endometriosis especially when it comes to management of endometriosis is actually to think about what is endometriosis how does it occur and that really helps us identify the ways in which we can help people because then you can match the actual treatment with um, the actual problems that are occurring and sometimes endometriosis is not just a condition but it's also a symptom in that if you have you know heavy painful periods they they can cause a, a lot of uh, blood flow and blood flow that goes up to fallopian tubes and into the pelvis and there is a theory that the shed endometrium during the menstrual cycle flows up to fallopian tubes and embeds in the peritoneal cavity causes inflammation pain adhesions and infertility and this is the primary thinking around endometriosis at the moment um, and so you may have endometriosis, but that doesn't cause heavy bleeding. It, it may be as a result of your heavy bleeding. In addition, you can get uh, metaplasia, which means a change, a, a, sort of a, a spontaneous change of the nature of tissues in the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdomen. And that often occurs in people with congenital uterine anomalies, which means abnormalities that you are born with. Um, in addition, you can get spread through the, the blood vessels, which are called vascular, or the lymph, which is um, tissues uh, of another kind of system. And those spread can um, cause lesions outside the pelvis, so in the, the uh, lung or other areas. And that's how these odd lesions occur. But what's important to note, just having bleeding and having bleeding up the fallopian tubes or even um, metaplasia, that doesn't just happen on its own, you need to have some kind of predisposition position. And we know there are some genetic changes, what we call polymorphisms, that have been identified that, that predispose people to having this condition. And we know about diagnostic delay. So this is a paper we published in 2020 looking at diagnostic delay. And women visited the GP on average of four times before referral. And the mean symptom to diagnosis time was around eight years, which is quite a long time. But even presenting to the GP, um, you know, after seeing the GP, there was a, quite a, a long delay. And even women suffered with symptoms and presented late, even so, so an average around a year after getting symptoms. Now, some people with more severe disease actually waited significantly longer. And we think this is because by the time it becomes more severe, invades the bowel or the bladder, the symptoms become confused. You can get IBS type symptoms or bladder symptoms. And so you may get, get referred down the wrong path. The vast majority of people were told the pain was normal. And this is um, often well-meaning uh, when people say that, because we know that psychologically in you know, looking at pain theories, hyper-focus on pain can exacerbate it and suppression and you know, body scan meditation and um, cognitive behavioral therapy is a very good way of coping with pain strategies so people do say well don't think about it don't focus on it it's normal um, so they are well-meaning but often it's not perceived that way it's it may be perceived as not taking it seriously and so that's what was really, really was felt in, in this study having menstrual cramps in adolescence uh, really delayed it, the, the diagnosis and, and this um, the average for that group was about 11 years versus two years if you didn't have menstrual cramps in adolescence and younger women um, were directly correlated with delay what that means is that the younger you are when you had symptoms the more likely you are to have a delay in your diagnosis and again some of that is being well-meaning because you, people are nervous about labeling a diagnosis or even doing operative, you know, doing surgery, doing laparoscopies on people who are young because they are worried about them, subjecting them to, to those kind of treatments, that even though it may be the right thing. So there is a traditional worry about that. So looking at outcomes, the reason I, I wanted to bring this slide in is 
part of what we were discussing about endometriosis is that, um, you know, what are the surgical outcomes? So this is a study we published in 2016, looking at surgical outcomes in those with severe endometriosis. And I want to just bring a highlight to the left-hand side. The right-hand side shows that generally in all the different parameters of uh, pain, uh, whether that be in, in bowel pain or otherwise, it, you generally get an improvement. But, what, but on the left-hand side, you can see uh, two different graphs. One, the upper color, which is the pink one, which is called conservative surgery. What that means is removing endometriosis that's involving the bowel and other organs, but leaving the womb and the ovaries behind. And then looking at the other side, where which is the yellow graph, that shows what happens with a pelvic clearance, which means removing all the endometriosis that's visible, but also removing the womb and the ovaries. And you can clearly see that actually at some removing the womb and the ovaries at the same time as removing the endometriosis has a significantly better outcome. And this actually, we've got data now, which is not yet published, the five-year data, and this difference between removing and leaving the womb and ovaries behind is maintained for up to five years as well. And what this goes back to is that uh, there are two things why this may be the case. One is that we looked when we looked at specimens, the actual um, wombs that were removed, over 90% had either adenomyosis or uterine endometriosis. So there was actually something within the womb itself that predisposed to pain. And um, in addition, when the womb is removed, you're no longer having periods. So if you go back to the actual uh, original thought about why endometriosis is formed by not having periods and not flooding the area with uh, um, endometrial tissue and blood and inflammatory things, they, um, you maintain that, that reduction over time. So it, it fits in with those theories of um, what we discussed earlier. Not everybody responds to surgery, and this is really important. This is something that um, it's really under researched and under and 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 so we looked at that specifically about non-responders to surgery, and we found that 25% of those with superficial endometriosis and 10% of those with deep endometriosis did not have benefit with surgery. And we looked at all kinds of markers, so markers looking at psychological effect, markers looking at pelvic pain, markers looking at um, quality of life scores, markers looking at bowel symptoms to try and identify any marker that we would say okay if you have this then you're not going to get better with surgery and we didn't actually find any um, specific marker that would say actually you you wouldn't be benefit you wouldn't benefit from surgery so that's really important to note because it's difficult difficult to predict in advance whether or not you'll get benefit the majority you do but it's important to note that if you don't get benefit it isn't necessarily bad surgery or um, other issues but there is a certain percentage who won't receive benefit there are other things that we're looking at now um, specifically uh, cat catastrophization scores and other various um, you know research markers that we're trying to identify see if we can predict who won't benefit from surgery and it's important to have other therapies to offer so when we talk about medical therapy later on you can look at those who don't respond to surgery um, and so medical therapies are really important in that, in that aspect another thing is looking at recurrence so a systematic review a systematic review is a, a study that looks at multiple trials together and collates the information and tries to give some kind of uh, result based on the multiple data that's available in the literature and so this particular one looked at 38 different articles and collated the inf information and they found that the recurrence rate varies from anywhere between 2% and 43%, depending on the length of follow-up. Uh, I went to visit the largest um, unit in um, Italy where they do, they do um, endometriosis surgery and their recurrence rate within two year years, if they didn't have medical therapy, was up to, was up to 40% as well. So... But when you look at actual hormonal therapies, the use of hormonal therapies within six weeks of surgery shows a significant reduction in endometriosis recurrence, with some studies showing the recurrence anywhere down to around four or five percent. So re really low single digits. So 
you know, medical therapy should definitely be considered in those not wishing to conceive. And, you know, there are long waiting lists at the moment in the NHS. And so medical therapies play a role in that, in that whilst you're waiting for surgery, there are many different ones. And sometimes it might not work with your body. You might, you might have other issues like PCOS or, or you may get irregular bleeding on the therapy or it may affect you psychologically. And so to use that, we try to use the time whilst you're waiting for surgery to actually find a medical therapy that suits you and suits your, um, you following surgery so that you can maintain a long-term uh, plan so that you don't have multiple laparoscopies. I remember when I first started training, there were patients who used to have almost a laparoscopy every year for endometriosis and really using hormonal therapies is something that is, is very beneficial in preventing that. So lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the hormonal treatments and how they work and what is the purpose of them. So the majority of what we use today is repurposed medicine. So it's not medicine that's designed or licensed for treatment for endometriosis. So it's not dosed as such. Uh, but the main purpose of treatment is to stop the periods and also to counteract estrogen. So some people may have benefit with the pill and having the pill with a break seems to be not as effective as having it continuously. And that makes sense because when you have a break, you're having withdrawal bleed. So you're having further bleeding and that can uh, precipitate pain and, and other problems. But one of the issues that we worry about with the pill is that you have relatively high doses of estrogen on top of what you, you already take. And so that can predispose to having potential stimulation of endometriosis in the background whilst you're taking the medicine and eventually it may stop being effective and you actually when on laparoscopy might have severe disease and we've seen quite a bit of that and, and so there is my preference and preference of uh, and actually what's borne out in the studies is that alternatives are better than using combined pill alternatives can be progesterone and progesterones are sort of counteract the effect of estrogen and so if you are able to tolerate them, they are really effective uh, and prevent you having periods, but also they have an anti-estrogen effect. So they, they help with counteracting the symptoms. And that may be something as simple as progesterone only pill that might work or something like a Mirena, which is a, um, and a device that sits inside the womb that releases estrogen. And they, they've both been shown to be effective and almost more effective than combined pills. Now there's something called GnRH agonists. And what these are, these are medicines that uh, hyperstimulate the brain in some way, causing the brain to switch off its production, uh, its signal to send to the ovaries to produce estrogen and progesterone. And these are really effective for shrinking endometriosis. But what they, they essentially do is turn off your system and uh, induce a temporary menopause. So obviously they have significant menopausal side effects, but they are uh, very effective in helping with endometriosis in a temporary way. And sometimes they're effective in people who don't have endometriosis, but may have you know, hormonally uh, sensitive pains that can respond to, to that. There are, but again, they can't be used in the long term. So, there is something called aromatase inhibitors, and we we can use them. They basically work on uh, a hormone, uh, an enzyme called aromatase, which is in uh, fat tissues that produces extra estrogen by converting other hormones to estrogen, and they they work on that. And they they can be really helpful in combination with other medicines, particularly for those who have uh, who have. have higher weight body weight relative to their height that so we often find that useful in that respect now there are two medicines that are licensed for the treatment of endometriosis that have been designed specifically for it that you may or may not be aware of so one of them is called deinergest so deinergest is a kind of modified progesterone but it also has an anti-inflammatory effect and it's licensed for the treatment for endometriosis it's been around globally for around you know 12 to 15 years and there's lots and lots of data around it and it seems to be superior to other progesterones and uh, you know it's very good in helping prevent uh, both periods and 
causes shrinkage of endometriosis and even cysts form from endometriosis. But again, as a progesterone, you may get progesterone type side effects. It's generally better tolerated than other progesterones, but you can sometimes get mood disturbances or irregular bleeding, but it's important to give it at least three months for it to, to see the full effect for you. There is another medicine called Rieco. Now Rieco is um, a medicine that at the same time switches off the body's production of estrogen and progesterone, but also replaces estrogen and progesterone at a lower level. Now, the reason it's different to a pill is that a pill has a relatively high dose of estrogen. And there's a dose of estrogen that your body needs to, to function and not get side effects. And above that dose, you stimulate things like fibroids and endometriosis. And what they've done with Rieco is they've, they've balanced the estrogen with progesterone and they've kept it low enough so that you don't get estrogen side effects, uh, um, side effects from lack of estrogen. But you also don't get stimulation of endometriosis. And this is something that's not available everywhere in the UK, uh, but it, it is available, licensed on the NHS and available. And it, it does, it, you know, it works really well for people who have, um, who can't tolerate progesterones. And it's very good at stabilizing mood, controlling uh, hormonal fluctuations and controlling bleeding and pain. So it's another tool, another option for us. And it has a, a very good, it plays a very um, good role in, in those who have difficulty. So I think um, that's where I'm going to stop now and hand over to Dr. Basil Water, who's going to take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Haider. I'll just share my slides. Um, it's often hard to top a uh, talk by Hydra here, you know, very comprehensive. So thank you very much. Um, again, thank you for Endometriosis UK and Variety for organizing this event. I'm quite pleased to take part because both conditions are, we know that they affect um, patients significantly, yet often not very well debated and spoken about. So just for any late uh, attendees, my name is Basil Wata. I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. I'm a fertility subspecialist based at Epsom San Helia, and I lead the research team in women's health in UCL. And I work very closely with Hydra between the fertility and the endometriosis, specifically trying to offer more comprehensive care for, for all our patients that have such chronic conditions like endometriosis and PCOS. So it's definite um, thrill to be talking about this today. I wanted to compliment um, where Haider left off. Basically, I'm sure a lot of the attendees today are asking, what is the link between PCOS and endometriosis? Can you actually have both? We don't have a very clear kind of like research finding that's saying that there is a strong link in terms of causality or causation. However, there is some sort of association where they're saying women with PCOS might have a higher degree of endometriosis. That in itself seems to be very unclear. There is also an interesting theory that is proven more and more that there might be a role for the um, sort of conditioning in the womb, and the exposure to the androgens or the male hormones in the womb. And that is suggesting that when there is higher exposure to these um, hormones in the womb, um, the female fetus is more likely to develop endometrial PCOS later on while if there is underexposure, they're more likely to develop endometriosis later on. These studies that I'm mentioning are more on animal models, so they haven't been strongly correlated in humans, We're waiting for more research on them. Now, are they co coexistent? So far, the evidence is suggesting something, anything from between 10% to 75% where there's endometriosis and PCOS in women. So obviously, Probably the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Uh, we're not sure yet. I think there's definitely call for more research. Perhaps this is a benefit of the pandemic is that I think most um, countries, specifically UK and US, are upgrading their epidemiological research tools and we're having better kind of like tools to collect more um, data at the, at, the, at the population level that will help us to um, address this important question. Now, as Haider alluded, is that often endometriosis is a delay in diagnosis and no surprise, PCOS is a primary victim of that. A woman with PCOS often go in cycles and back and forth between different specialists 
the main difference is that with East West, there's so many different specialists involved. So there's the GP, there's the endocrinologist, there's the general gynecologist, and the fertility specialist, and the dermatologist. And they all give tend to give you know small pieces of advice, but no one is really offering this comprehensive care that um, these patients desire. There is more and more um, access to you know, promising diagnostic tests and tools. Personally, I think the rapid access to um, decent scanning facilities plus minus diagnostic laparoscopy is probably the best method to achieving this diagnosis early, which will enable these patients to start um, kind of like early preventive or helpful interventions to reduce the impact of these two chronic conditions on their um, long-term health outcomes. So treatment strategies, again, we've touched upon some very promising um, medical uh, treatments for endometriosis. Similarly, I'm you know, quite glad that there's more progress in terms of treatments for PCOS. So now we're seeing some, I'm sure you all heard in the news about the semaglutide or the Ozempic, which is a, a, a GLP-1 agonist, which is helpful to um, promote weight loss. Um, I think it's definitely a helpful step because often weight gain is looked as the, the, the key to uh, resolve PCOS. I don't think it is. And it's often like the chicken and the egg, which is really causing uh, the other, is it the PCOS causing weight gain or, or weight gain causing PCOS? Um, hard to unpick, but semaglutide is definitely helpful. However, on its own is not, you know, particularly uh, effective. So it needs to be complemented with effective lifestyle intervention. And we're currently planning to do some studies looking into the effect of intermittent fasting on restoring ovulation in those patients with, with PCOS to help them achieve better weight gain. Um, Rieko Hydra just touched upon it, and I think it does have a place in PCOS as well. And now there is new kind of like new generations of the contraceptive pills, such as Trovelis, which is offering a little bit more targeted treatments to uh, those patients with PCOS in terms of treating the hirsutism and acne, as well as the uh, menstrual irregularity. So some progress, but we definitely need a little bit more research. And I wanted to touch upon the importance of this offering homogenous care, where, for example, you have someone who is coming with PCOS and endometriosis, and they're going for surgery. There is often a missed opportunity where different specialists might not be present to often the, the better approach. So, for example, if they're looking for optimizing their fertility, it might be warranted to perform a excision of their endometriosis. And I'll, I'll also touch upon ovarian dr uh, drilling, which is a somewhat reliable technique to help them uh, restore their ovulation and maybe get pregnant spontaneously. So these kind of like uh, combined treatments can only happen when we have more homogenous um, care pathways and there have different specialists available to cooperate among themselves, which is not always easy, unfortunately, in the NH in current NHS settings, at least. Um, so that's one of the elements I wanted to touch upon, the importance of MDT care. And certainly at Epsom Sanhelia, we try very much to be um, cooperative in that essence. We, we hold joint operating lists and we have like joint diagnostics and uh, testing. So to help really clear the diagnostic pathway for these um, patients with chronic diseases and also speed up the treatment uh, plan. And I'm sure Alison will agree with, with several talks with, with Verity we've done, there is a urgent need for more uh, comprehensive um, uh, treatment pathways for, for patients with PCOS because they often ping ball between secondary and primary care quite a lot without really reaching a conclusion or they get just a, a like a, a um, a, a temporary fix for their problems. So they help them to achieve an ovulation in pregnancy, but no one looks at their long-term risk in terms of di development diabetes or endometrial hyperplasia or what have you. So there is a need for this um, more comprehensive and, and kind of like collaborative uh, approach to it. Um, we've published quite a bit on this in terms of what sort of um, re re both research and healthcare settings that are required. Often uh, the key things that is highlighted is better GP education, and I'm sure a lot of the um, attendees with us today will 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 agree that they, they they face a barrier when they're accessing asking their GP to refer them for further diagnosis. So um, again, thanks to Verity's support, we're now having starting a national um, educational course on PCOS to help 
educate the GPs better on, on the sort of symptoms and treatments and available appropriate referral pathways. And I'm very hopeful we can do something similar for endometriosis very soon. Uh, hence why I'm advocating for this patient-centered lifelong approach. And this is particularly relevant to those patients with both conditions because it's it's possible, we don't have proof of it, that they might be, when they're younger, their PCOS symptoms are flaring up and they're more visible. But as they advance in age, their PCS is attenuating a little bit and then their endometriosis becomes a little bit more visible. So it's important we adopt this lifelong approach to not just those those patients, but all uh, women's health, basically, because it, it is predictable and we can do a better um, um, job at, attract, at addressing the different health needs across different life stages. We have, we definitely need more research on this. And again, I think there has been a recent um, uh, all party, uh, all uh, parliamentary group supporting more um, research for both endometriosis and MPCOS, which is definitely great news. And I'm hoping we'll, um, we'll start some new projects on that. And as we mentioned is that there is these novel treatments. Unfortunately, the cycle of introducing these treatments into the NHS and making them available to the wider population is often very slow. And that is not um, in the benefit of patients. And we all need to you know, do a better job on that. And certainly in our local trust, we have made so many applications to uh, the local uh, funding body so that we can make these new treatments available for our patients on the NHS setting. And uh, we're hoping other trusts will join suit and the final slide that I want to talk about is the importance of listening to the patient and really putting their health needs at the center of designing these health services and also these research studies. So very recently, we published this um, article with, in collaboration with Parity and other um, late consumers, where it clearly highlighted their, their treatment priorities, which don't always align with what the health regulators or the researchers or the health professionals, for that matter, think that it's a priority. So for example, they all in, in highlighted the importance of looking into quality of life outcome measures and mental health elements in dealing with, uh, with PCOS. And I'm, I'm sure this is the situa similar situation in endometriosis. Unfortunately, these tend to be things that are less addressed both in healthcare setting and research setting. So I think there is need to be a shift in culture where there's active co um, collaboration between the health professionals, the researchers, and the patients, so that we can have, a, you know, progress in in addressing these two these two conditions. And you know, definitely today's webinar is one step on that on that on that path. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. Uh, thank you for listening, and um, I think we're happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, thank you both. Um, so Alison is now going to share her experience, and then we'll move on to the questions. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for allowing me to share my story. And uh, so, so kind of why am I here today? So I'm a trustee of Verity and I'm a passionate women's health ambassador. And more importantly, I'm you. I have PCOS and endometriosis. And so I, I'll declare now, so I'm 51. So I was diagnosed in my, in my late twenties and my late thirties. So the world and medicine and, and internet and technology has gone on leaps and bounds. So obviously a kind of, you know, when I was diagnosed, so things that we kind of take for granted now kind of weren't around, but anyway. So I'm in my late twenties and uh, this is how I kind of um, came across my PCOS diagnosis. So I'm in my late 20s and I'm talking to my GP that things aren't right. In fact, actually, I think I've got the early menopause. Uh, so my GP very proactively refers me to a gynecologist and I get some bloods and a consultation. And it's decided I've got PCOS. Unfortunately, the way that my diagnosis was delivered was quite dreadful and the words have remained with me for life. So I sat in the consultation room with myself and my boyfriend, now husband, and was told, you've got PCOS. We know nothing about this. There's nothing I can do. There's no cure and you'll never have children. 
And in your mid twenties, when your life is bobbing along and you're doing all the stuff that everyone else seems to be doing around education, job, you know, settling into home life, you know, relationships and all of that. And you're looking forward to kind of, you know, a long-term relationship and, you know, potentially children. That, that was quite kind of, you know, our, my kind of world and a big hole kind of appeared. Um, so for about, and I was given no information, so we were dispatched, nothing could be done, and I was discharged. And Stuart and I, my, uh, my husband now, um, we kind of stumbled around, and one day I was out shopping and I picked up a magazine because it was raining outside and there was an umbrella with a magazine, and I hadn't got my umbrella with me. So when I got home after using the umbrella, I kind of thought I'll have a look at that magazine, and there was an article in it about PCOS and Verity. So I wrote off, because that's what you did in those days, so I wrote off and I became a member of Verity. And at my first meeting, I think I spent crying because at last I was with other people who were exactly the same. And I was hearing a load of stuff about what was going wrong with my body and what I could do. And literally my husband and I were no longer alone. Um, so th that really did change my life. So I bob along and I'm kind of, you know, dip and dive between gynees and endocrinologists in my early 30s, trying to kind of manage some of my symptoms. And then about my late 30s, my gynecologist discusses with me that actually with the advances in fertility, that the original statement was now null and void, there was a possibility of conceiving. And uh, but due to my age, I was late 30s, you know, I kind of probably should be progressing straight away to fertility treatments because time was of the essence. I was very overweight, so I quickly went on one of those very low calorie diets to lose the weight at speed so I could qualify for IVF, etc. However, I lost loads of weight and I was feeling, you know, kind of like this is hopeful, we're on the right path here. But my abnormal uterine bleeding just wouldn't stop. In fact, it just seemed to be worse than better. I thought kind of losing the weight, it would be better. And so I went back to my guy and said, something's, you know, I'm, I'm, there's something still not right here. And, you know, because I'd lost the weight, it was straight through to a laparoscopy and I got diagnosed with endometriosis. So it added an added complication into, you know, conceiving. So we spent a couple of years with assistants and trying and it didn't work. And kind of by my early 40s, Stuart and I decided, you know, we'd draw a line, we'd have the possibility um, and it wasn't to be. Um, but we'll always you know, be grateful for the possibility and chance. So having both has really impacted my life. So <clears throat> obviously there's no children. And, you know, kind of in, in some senses, though, I, I'm quite glad that I went from no hope to some possible to not at all so I kind of feel that kind of bit is resolved in my life which is you know quite good but I want to assure you that things are so much more different please do not take me as a kind of an example and you know for your reassurance things were very different you know when I was in my 20s and 30s and what's possible and what we know now just wasn't known so I really want to reassure you that it's you know there is possibility really important to get those support networks access information join endometriosis UK join the verity talk to people you know from credible sources and you should never take that journey alone, ever, okay? It's a journey shared with many others for your support, absolutely. Yes, I've got excessive weight, that's another impact, and, uh, and it, I've, I've kind of got it on a continuous record as all you need to do is lose weight. I do feel that if I kind of had my time again, I'd probably come back and try and invent whatever it is to help with weight loss. And it's very difficult because if you've never been fat, you don't know what it's like. And you're know, kind of having PCOS, it, it's difficult. And it's, it's always, you know, it's always been a kind of a bit of a battle. Um, I've tried lots of diets, you know, I've been considered for gastric surgery. I've even thought about liposuction, looking at potentially the, you know, the kind of semi-glutide, you know, the Govi kind of injections as a support tool as well. So that's the kind of one of my main frustrations is kind of that, you know, 51, I'm still big and I don't want to be this. This is not how I want my life to be. 
Um, last few things about how it also impacts your life, hair, hair, hair and hair. So interestingly, I went in my kind of teens and 20s and 30s to being an absolute slave to my razor. You know, kind of tons of you know, hair suitism and fortunately I didn't have facial hair. I was very, very fortunate. So I didn't have that battle and that kind of I I impact on your self-esteem. And then suddenly I kind of went on the other scale and got alopecia. So I've kind of gone through the whole scale of um, kind of having, you know, and I've now got quite significant, you know, hair loss on my head. And again, actually, interestingly, it's, it's, it's easier to hide the fact that you weren't able to have children, but it's not easy to hide that you've got hair loss. And uh, so that's kind of, it's quite an intriguing kind of, you know, situation to be in. Um, again, um, I don't miss show, shaving my legs daily. So there is every, there is a silver lining to every cloud always. I've had acne, um, you know, I kind of uh, saw a dermatologist in my teens. I had, you know, kind of very high grade acne treatment and also the oral contraceptive at the same time. My acne disappeared, my periods became kind of regulated and managed. Life was looking fab. I was off at university and starting my career. And actually interesting on reflection, I think that if I hadn't just started that then, perhaps my symptoms would have come to the fore more and actually I might have got my PCOS diagnosis earlier and perhaps, you know, kind of, you know, that, that might have helped or it might not. There is the big thing about abnormal uterine bleeding, not a pleasant discussion to have. It does, you know, affect your life. You know, I can remember, you know, kind of my life being dominated about where's the nearest toilet, constantly having spare knickers and tons of, you know, period products in my handbag. Yeah, you know, the kind of the, incessant in constant bleeding you know unable to get off the toilet changing the bed sheets at night you know soiling multiple clothing i was very fortunate i could afford period products uh lots of people can't and my you know kind of and, and how you're know, battling that already and not able to actually get the things that you need to make yourself comfortable and clean must be absolutely horrific I mean, I was spending, I think, you know, kind of, you know, five pounds a day on period products at the worst time. And it's very difficult. It impacts everything. You know, your kind of health and well-being. You feel absolutely kind of drained, your intimacy, you know, and it's really difficult to try and have those conversations with your GPs and specialists regards management of the kind of the cause rather than just the symptoms. Um, and in the end, I tried some marina coils. Didn't work successfully for me. They may work successfully for you. Um, so every, you know, every person is different. So it might work successfully for you. In the end, actually, in my um, mid 40s, I had a, um, a thermal ablation. And that was really a kind of a game changer. My kind of health and well-being restored. I could get on with life. And also by then, it was an easier choice because we decided that we didn't want to have children. So actually, it was a logical kind of, you know, the next step. So about 25 odd years later, it's been a bit of a journey, you know, lots of things that have happened, you know, you have a thermal ablation, I've got alopecia, etc. However, I want to assure you that it's not all bad because actually I think I know my body really well. And I think the one thing is that when I speak to other, you know, folks at work or, you know, outside, whatever, they just don't seem to know their bodies as well as I do. So actually, I think I know my body really well and you'll get to know your body really well. I've met countless wonderful people with PCOS and endometriosis and both. I've been part of Verity and Endometriosis UK, so I've made some really good friends for life. And I think the things I've learned and to kind of share with you, because no two people are the same, no two stories are the same, is have a good relationship with your GP and health professionals. You're both experts, you know, the professionals by education and you, the patients by experience. Seek support. This is something you just don't do alone. Join up Verity and Endo UK and keep yourself informed to help you have those constructive discussions and those constructive decisions. And my motto is to maintain me in my kind of life is I've got PCOS and endometriosis. It's part of my life, but it's not my life. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, I was reading like the comments and someone's um, 
a few people have said thank you and said what an inspiration so thank you so much for just sharing and being so open um i really um I really have learned a lot from your talk as well as uh, Basil and Haida too. Um, I'm going to start with the questions um, and just we, we're not we've got quite a lot of questions but we're not going to get through all of them but rest assured that we've got our specialist advisor who after the talk um, will follow up with the questions that we haven't answered and also Alison and I um, we were talking before this webinar and we think that this should be something that we do um, mm -hmm. uh, like a series of because yes. it's just like kind of scraping the surface uh, right now so yeah we're looking forward to doing more so don't worry um we've got more information coming for you um so my first question um is does pcos affect estrogen levels um if so does this affect the growth of endometriosis shall i start on this so um um so PCOS, the status of having PCOS is commonly associated with high levels of estrogen. And that is because there is no this cyclical um, uh, period happening every month. However, that is also associated with the lack of menstruation. And a lot of, a lot of women with PCOS are not mm -hmm. having any periods or they have very few periods a year. That is not a prerequisite. So not every person with PCOS will not be having periods. So if they are having regular periods, there might be a higher chance of having endometriosis as well, because uh, you know the, the way to diagnose PCOS is two out of three, irregular periods, appearance of um, multiple um, follicles or cysts on the ultrasound, and also blood tests showing high androgens. Mm -hmm. So if someone falls within the second two categories and have regular periods, that doesn't preclude um, endometriosis uh, but if they are not having regular periods generally they will be having higher levels of estrogen on a chronic basis i hope that answers the questions i don't know Hyder, if you have anything to add no no that's that's excellent thank you thank you um so my next question is what is your opinion on the research currently being looked at in strasbourg that states that people should still be considered and diagnosed with endometriosis even when no endometrial growths or tissue have been found outside the womb, but individuals still start, start, still suffers with all the other symptoms of endometriosis. Um, do you think those who present with all symptoms but no endo tissues growth found should still have endometriosis? Quite yeah, a long so, question, so I'm happy to repeat. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fine. No, I, I got it. Thank you. So I think the thing to be we have to understand, I think, when we go back to uh, what are the, the symptoms. And you can get non-endometriotic uh, pelvic pain that is hormonally sensitive. And much of what can be found is um, problems with the womb itself. So adenomyosis, um, endometriosis within the, the actual muscle wall. And even if there's no adenomyosis histologically, you can still get hormonally sensitive non endometriotic pelvic pain it would be difficult to say to somebody you have endometriosis with no visual or histological diagnosis and i think it would it, it confuses things and it it, it plays with uh, you know diagnosis but really ultimately if you have a laparoscopy and you don't have endometriosis it doesn't mean there aren't any options for you and we would recommend to go through various options whether that be um, hormonal therapies and so forth. But if there's no response to any hormones whatsoever, then it's likely that it's not, um, you know, gynecologically re related. And so uh, quite often people will find some kind of response. Even interestingly, if they have things like um, hypermobility or Ellis Danlos, they can get uh, pelvic pain that responds to hormones, e even though mm -hmm. they don't have uh, um, endometriosis. So um, that's my view on it. Thank you. Um, my next question is, um, so this is someone who's um, been managing their endometriosis for quite some time and they're on their waiting list, on the finally waiting list. Um, and is there anything that they can do to make the process quicker? Um, uh, uh, it's 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 a tricky one because obviously there are waiting lists and you know it, it, that is you know, it is what it is. 
I think obviously I kind of I work for the NHS so when I'm talking to patients who are kind of obviously kind of on waiting lists I, I do say to people obviously you know what can you do you know talk to your GPs practice nurses about what can you do to manage some of your symptoms in the interim to kind of reduce down the impact also I mean in some senses it, it dep depends on the trust and the organization and what can happen often a friendly call to the PALS department the patient advice liaison service can be helpful to say that obviously you're keen for your appointment and perhaps if you're amenable you know to a cancellation or whatever that may be a possibility you know so that you can you know, kind of you know, access you know kind of perhaps a little quicker I mean, you know, it's, I think it's about kind of how you, for me as, as a patient and, and talking to other patients is what can you do now with the support of GPs and primary care? Is your organisation that you're being referred to, can they do like a PALS inquiry to see if they can, you're, you're available for a you know, cancellation, you know, but you may have to literally drop things and kind of go that day or the next day. So you just need to be prepared for that. Thank you. And is there a conflict between taking the typical prescribed hormone treatments for endometriosis and insulin regulators for PCOS? Are there any interactions or long-term um, impacts to be aware of? Not that we know of for now, but uh, I presume by insulin regulators, they mean insulin sensitizers like metformin. Uh, there are quite a few types of these, so namely, it's, like old school ones like metformin that has been around for a very long time and it's very well tested and proven safe that could be used reliably with contraception there are some newer ones like the uh, ozempic or semaglutide which is technically an insulin sensitizers and there are others that are like stiga uh, stigaliptins and others that are more used in type 2 diabetes but have been used previously in pcos to regulate periods and aid weight loss um, no direct link between them in terms of like one stopping the other or reducing its impact. Um, however, I think it should be put into context of why we're using both. Like what is the objective of using both? Is it for to aid weight loss or is it to regular periods and aid ovulation or so on? So it, 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 I, I think it has to be put into like a more kind of individualized comprehensive treatment plan. It's not is not something that I would offer to all patients with PCOS. It has to be put into the context of each individual patient uh, circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is, I've heard from other specialists that the theory of retrograde menstruation has been disproven as a cause for endometriosis. Is that is this not agreed among consultants? Why do some say this is a cause and others say this has been disproven? Oh, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll answer that. So it's not that it's been disproven at all. In fact, it's the prevailing theory amongst uh, um, the medical literature, even to the extent since 2017 um, and even more recently, 2022, there have been studies published looking at the actual genetic makeup of endometrial tissue, so biopsies from the endometrium as compared to endometriosis. And they have the same epigenetic markers and activators. So they can actually track the DNA. They can track the uh, actual um, polymo the actual uh, things that go, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mutations, they can track the mutations and they can track the change from endometrial tissue to endometriosis. And, and so it, it is quite well established in that. However, you know, people have theories and they have ideas, but the other theories don't have medical, don't have a lot of medical support whilst, you know, the, the retrograde menstruation has, especially now, much more robust data together with DNA methylation studies, epigenetic studies, um, and specific data studies looking at that. So, um, and more importantly, when you look at results, if you stop periods, it makes a difference. So, you know, if you remove the womb, it makes a difference because it stops periods. So not only do you have the genetic studies, epigenetic studies, but when you implement medical therapies that do what we think is the cause, they make a difference to people's quality of life. So we have the whole, um, obviously nothing is 100%, but we have the whole set of studies mm -hmm. that support the theory from um, theoretical, biochemical, 
and actual practical implications that make a difference to patients' lives. Thank you. Um, is chronic fatigue linked to endometriosis and how can I manage it? I'll leave that to you, Haida. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think there is a link in that um, chronic fatigue as a con as a as a feeling is is very much linked to endometriosis because if you have chronic pain that really interferes with your quality of life, mm -hmm. yeah. your life you get exhausted from it. In addition, heavy bleeding causes iron depletion, anemia, and you have the combination of uh, heavy bleeding together with chronic pain. Uh, it, it's incredibly fatiguing, both yeah. physically fatiguing, yep. psychologically, and mm -hmm. uh, emotionally. So that that is definitely an aspect of it. Whether it's chronic fatigue syndromes as a separate entity, I think it's unclear. Uh, Alison, what is your thought? Well, I think I certainly noticed a difference after I had my thermal ablation. I mean, literally kind of, you know, suddenly I went from like feeling like a depleted battery to kind of like being fully charged. Um, and because I just wasn't, you know, losing so much blood. Um, I mean, I was very fortunate after my thermal ablation, I actually completely stopped bleeding. It's not a, you know, a choice for everyone, but it was a choice for me at my time of life. So I think it's important that you make choices based on the course of your life, your age and what choices you want and what, you know, the kind of, you know, kind of what, what kind of impact you want on your symptom management. Definitely, though, when I stopped the bleeding, uh, literally kind of felt like a you know, recharged battery and, you know, kind of my energy levels came up. You know, I was feeling a lot more confident, you know, the kind of, um, you know, my pain subsided. So it, in some senses, for me, it was a really positive, you know, impact. Um, and, you know, now I just get tired normally from normal life rather than my periods and my pain. Thank you both. Um, so does medical therapy just mask the issue rather than assisting with the problem? Yeah, so that depends on the medical therapy. So we mentioned already the combined oral contraceptive pill um, that we worry is masking because you have high estrogen levels. But when it comes to things like Deinergest, um, Deinergest, they've done studies where they've laparoscoped. So they do a laparoscopy, look inside, give the demogest and re-laparoscope six months later and they could see visible, visible shrinkage of endometri uh, endometriosis. In addition, uh, on endometriomas, mm -hmm. which is cyst formed by endometriosis, you can actually track visible reductions in size mm -hmm. in studies. So there, are um, equally with the Rieco, again, you've got, you've got not as much data as it as demogest, but these more modern therapies, more modern licensed therapies have are more targeted and more effective and are not masking, but actually help mm. directly with the underlying cause mm -hmm. as well as, um, uh, you know, help, helping prevent recurrence. So mm. I think the answer is it depends on what yeah. you're taking. And, 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 and I think I think once you made the diagnosis, so say like um, in PCOS, which often most patients are diagnosed in their early 20s or, if, if you know, I'm hoping at least they're not much delayed diagnosis. <laughs> Um, once you made the diagnosis, it, it, we know it's a lifelong condition. So it's about yeah. managing these symptoms. So there's not much masking of it. It's, it, it's just yeah. dealing with it ongoingly. And, and same for endometriosis, as you mentioned, either there's high risk of recurrence. So once it's been dealt off, you need to continuously manage it. And that's yeah. where probably medical therapy of, of most value. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And will testosterone levels continue to rise in PCOS or do they plateau? <clears throat> oh, how interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, so first of all, they're not high in all patients with PCOS. So as I, as I mentioned, you need three, two out of three criteria to um, get the diagnosis of PCOS. And there's a good portion of uh, PCOS um, patients who have basically just irregular periods and an appearance of polycystic over. over or ovaries on ultrasound scan with very normal testosterone level. The main challenge we have is that these testosterone levels are not been very well validated and referenced in, 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 in women. We know where they should be in men, but we don't know where they should be in women. So they, they vary a lot and the tests available are not very accurate. And so this whole, you know, diagnosing them on, on the blood is, is a bit of a tricky field from a, from a science perspective. Um, the answer is 
most likely they, they vary from cycle to cycle and throughout the day. So for example, in men, we know that testosterone varies a lot from early rise in the morning to later on in the day. It depends what time you measure it, you'll find a lot of these variations. Mm -hmm. And we simply do not have similar data for that in, 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 in women. And that is the difficulty in saying is how high is it or how low is it and how mm -hmm. it is correlated to symptoms. So there's a lot of uncertainty here, but those who have high androgens or high testosterone at the time of diagnosis will probably continue to have it higher than counterparts. How high it goes and low, it's not a continuous status. It will go through a lot of variations from cycle to cycle, from month to, to month, and then from year to year as well. So I'm a bit unknown. I hope this is answering. No, that did. Um, I'm going to make this our last question just because we're just running out of time. But so the next one is my symptoms have worsened since having the marina coil. Is that contradictory to most cases? So, so the marina can be very effective, but it doesn't work for everybody. No. Estimated that around 20% of people will have no bleeding on the marina. Uh, but there's a good proportion where it can cause pain that you find uncomfortable, you get cramping or you can get irregular spotting, bleeding. Mm. And so if it doesn't work for you, there are alternatives that you can try yeah. for sure. Uh, but it, uh, but it, that's not, um, it, so, so it, it might not work for you, um, but that, mm. that's okay. And, it, and that happens sometimes. 